Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Latin. Um, I got here Marie and Danny. We're going to be talking to you about building serverless and microservices architecture with uh, .NET Core. Um, first of all, uh, a little bit about myself. I've been a .NET uh, for the longest time. I worked on a lot of uh, uh, Microsoft projects in my, you know, very old past, and, um, um, and uh, I've, I've dealt with it on both, uh, on multiple platforms and a lot of it on AWS uh, itself. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you first about traditional .NET architectures, uh, probably something the way you are currently running things or the way you are, you, you're transitioning over to running things and all that, kind of what you can do right now, what you can do in an interim, what you probably already have running, and then um, I'm going to hand it over to Marie. Uh, uh, it's going to be talking about how to build it through uh, by means of microservices and serverless architectures. Um, and then you'll hear from Danny about how that all works in real time, uh, in, in real world at Experian. So what are the current issues? What are nightmares that we have when we work with .NET applications um, you know, in traditional manner, right? In the old school way, if you're dealing with any of the legacy applications, right? Number one, they're stateful, right? Why stateful when I, most of the things that I need the state for, I can keep that information in a database, right? What about the asymmetric resource utilization? What do I mean by that? Well, think about it, if you're running uh, mo most of the things, I mean, you'll see, depending really who designed the applications on your side, it could have been some consulting company, it could have been another team, it could have been someone from the past. Maybe they followed the best architectures. Uh, you, I don't know if you remember .NET uh, patterns and practices and all that. Uh, maybe they didn't. <laughs> maybe they didn't know too well how to develop application layers in .NET, so they built the entire thing uh, using store procedures uh, <laughs> on SQL. And, uh, and in, so basically, you know, you, you would have a mix of trans both transactional and batch type services that are running, and they would asymmetrically use both RAM and CPU and IOPS on your side. So that's not a good thing, right? Um, you, what about the CDCI solutions, right? There weren't too many that were great or they weren't like extremely expensive that you could use in the .NET world in the past. Um, so, you know, and for the most part, as you kind of transition between environments, as you would go from, um, you know, from your development to integration to test and to QA, um, you know, you would have like a different set of dependencies. You would have a different set of like, you know, frameworks that are, that, that are needed. Things could be working on my machine, as the big thing says over there, but they're definitely not working, you know, on any other environment as it goes on. You know, they would be running great on bare metal, but not that great on, um, on virtual environment. A lot of these things, people, you know, developers didn't care about the infrastructure aspects and how these things should be running, so they are all running in a very monolithic way. Um, store procedures are already mentioned, right? That has been a nightmare of decoupling. Like, how are you going to scale that? It's impossible to scale. SQL Server doesn't scale, right? It only scales upwards. It doesn't scale horizontally. Um, uh, and, um, of course, full trust solutions, right? For the most part, what a nightmare that was, right? I mean, you know, you could really have full access, full system access to the entire, um, you know, uh, oper if it was a security issue, obviously, from one side, but also it, it, it could use resources in which way nobody could manage in any or isolate in any way, right? All of that was result resulting in too many points of failure. But having, having all that in mind, right, um, we've, these are kind of the current kind of traditional .NET architectures, uh, not only on, a, uh, you know, on a AWS side of things, but mostly that are probably running currently in your data center or, or, um, you know, or, or on some other platform, um, so to speak. But let's, let's look at it like if you were to kind of run it on, uh, on AWS, right? There are a few things that do help us here, right? Uh, things like uh, having different availability zones, right? What are the availability zones? They're effectively uh, um, clusters of data centers that are geographically displaced from one another. Um, and if you, if you were to actually uh, uh, span your architecture between two AZs, that pretty much already qualifies, in a sense, as a DR environment. So you're already achieving quite a bit of a availability and resilience just by doing so. Right? Um, you can use our, 
they should be popping out. Um, yeah, there they are. Um, I ELB, external ELB, um, without actually needing to put any of the server roles into a DMZ or public subnet in this case. Uh, you can use VPC, uh, uh, VPC net get gateways um, that auto scale and you don't have to worry about like having just like net instances uh, when it comes to having to pull update from. Uh, uh, private subnets, for instance, is running in private subnets. Um, you can ha use um, RDGW uh, as, a, as a jump box to actually get in and administer any of these things. Um, I don't know if you've had, and you can also have an internal access just as well in a very secure way. Um, you can put uh, certificates on it. Uh, you can offload much of the, uh, um, much, much of the um, uh, media storage on S3 by VPC endpoints in there. There's quite a bit that you can do, right? So there are transitional ways in which, in which you can, can kind of transition over to AWS with traditional .NET architectures as you're transitioning over to more mod modern architectures that uh, my colleagues here are going to be talking about. Um, we do have a lot of uh, um, also managed services that you can use, things like AWS Directory Service. We, it's a fully, full-blown managed Microsoft Active Directory. You can either have you know, the enterprise one or the, uh, or the standard one. You, can, um, you have schema uh, extensions. You can establish a one-way or two-way trust. Um, you can use ADFS um, and, and with, uh, with its proxies to, um, to go ahead and federate to um, either you know, to your on-premise or to other systems or to your partner, um, um, partner sites and so on, partner solutions. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit that, that, that you can utilize from what we have got to offer already uh, from CloudFormations and from uh, quick starts that we've built, right? Um, other thing, you can, you can also use our, our code services. Um, you can use code pipeline, um, which is basically our, how we did um, uh, CDCI internally at Amazon uh, for many years for building all of our services. A lot of our customers uh, took one look at it and they were like, this is amazing, guys. Please go ahead and make this available for all of us to use. And that really gave birth to AWS Code Pipeline. Um, you can, uh, you, as a source in it, you can use things like uh, GitHub, Git, our managed Git is code commit. Uh, you can use uh, S3, and S3 is really kind of a binding glue uh, with any other solution, um, like TFS with uh, AWS uh, uh, Toolkit uh, can actually uh, go ahead and push uh, packages out um, uh, to, to S3, and they will automatically then, then be uh, pushed over to code build, uh, AWS code build, or, or, and to code uh, deploy. Um, We'll, see, we'll hear Marie actually touch on that a little bit more later uh, on the microservices side of things. Um, and, um, and in that way, integrate it. So you can use VSTS in the cloud, or you can use TFS uh, in, in the context of AWS code pipeline. Code build can be used either to actually uh, build the solution or to test our solution. It's very easy, it's very straightforward. Um, it uses a uh, uh, build spec file to actually where you can define your scripts in a very easy way and where you want to copy the files over. Um, and code deploy can do uh, both normal deployments, uh, uh, you know, in sequential deployments or blue green deployments, where it can actually replicate the same environment, deploy it over there, test it out, and then do connection draining from one to another and decommission the previous one. Uh, pretty, pretty awesome, pretty powerful stuff, and very consistent. Uh, specifically for .NET development. Um, making use, making use of serverless architecture on our side. There are many services. I, I do only have a few here uh, that, I'm, that I'm gonna mention. Um, you know, things like, uh, you know, S3 already mentioned Kinesis for real-time processing with massive amounts of data that uh, you either need to hook into uh, as an event or you need to pipe it out to uh, specific systems or uh, uh, specific data warehouses or something like that. Um, using things like uh, um, Cognito for actually authentication side of things, we use that on a, you know, for a lot of mobile applications and so on. Um, what about uh, using, on a .NET side, we use Windows Workflow Foundation, Windows, uh, uh, Windows Communication Foundation, uh, you know, for building out um, ESB and all that, and Windows Workflow Foundation for uh, state machine workflows and all that. We do have, um, a, you know, much simpler services on our side, things like um, AWS Step Functions, which actually allows you to build very easily 
um, in uh, schema-based language um, state machine workflows um, that work in conjunction with Lambda. And you, most of you probably know what Lambda is. For those of you that don't know, that is really the core of our microservices side of, uh, where you can use actually C Sharp to write out, uh, you know, literally a piece of code uh, that we actually we execute and run in the background. We ensure the full availability and uh, uh, resilience on our side. Um, all you have to just worry about to what API or what you want the code to do itself. So, so the step functions can either execute lambdas or they can work through activity steps by execution of any of the code, whether they be running on containers or any other external servers or anything like that. Extremely powerful, extremely also easy to use. Um, API Gateway, really for, for traditional architecture, I'm gonna only talk about the traditional side of things. Marie will talk about more um, you know, on the serverless side. Um, I've used it to like encapsulate um, our legacy services, like SOAP services um, by, um, that needed to actually provide a RESTful endpoint. Um, so, and you can encapsulate just, just about any aspect or basically create very quickly an API um, that, that behind, so the way it kind of works is that you have an API gateway that you, know, you, you just define uh, you know, the, the RESTful endpoint quite easily um, and then um, you know, there's, there's, um, um, the payload goes out to the Lambda function which again you can write in C Sharp and then you can just decide whatever you want to do with it and how you want to respond back. Uh, quite easily. Um, things like SNS, um, oh my God, what a useful service. Um, not only can it talk to other uh, uh, you know, RESTful services and other services in general, but it can also send out emails, it can send SMSs, it can do a lot. You can do tons of things to decouple um, um, you know, very problematic parts of your legacy .NET applications using our serverless services. SCS for sending out emails, um, you can use Alexa, obviously, and all that. There's, there's quite a bit in which you can actually jazz up your existing applications and existing architectures before you even transition over to microservices and serverless. So, where do you want to be? What is the message? You want to be stateless, for crying out loud. Really, we do not need stateful services anymore. This is... This is an issue for so many, uh, on, on so many levels and for so many reasons, right? Um, we want to make sure that, uh, that we have a highly scalable, self-healing and available architecture. Our serverless services provide this thing already for you. You don't have to worry about whether you're actually doing a multi-AZ deployment or anything like that and how it's going to fail over. We do that for you, right? And they are com comparatively, they're so much cheaper than anything that you would be running on EC2, never mind any anywhere else. Um, make use of the, the serverless platform. Try and augment as much of the, this complicated functionality uh, from your current applications. Uh, use Lambda, use step functions, use API gateways. Um, open yourself up to using NoSQL databases like DynamoDB. They're very easy and quick to use in a serverless way. Uh, simple queuing service for queuing, simple notification service uh, for communication either between services or to you know, your emails and SMSs and so on. And make use of things, um, I think that we're gonna be talking more about, like um, um, ECS, uh, container services, and uh, AWS Batch, which is really an overlay on top of ECS, uh, that, uh, that is a, a fully managed service that manages execution of batch um, jobs, which are effectively tasks, uh, for specific batch applications. Um, and use that, really, uh, to, uh, to execute a, a specific task and specific services um, um, if they need to be running uh, for a prolonged period of time or just as a batch um, in a way where you just need to execute um, something for, that needs to run on a specifically optimized um, instance with specific resources assigned to it and that can kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, kind of die and, uh, and be recycled uh, without incurring any more cost. So, with that, I hand over to Marie, who's going to be talking to you about how to start building out uh, microservices using .NET Core architecture. Thank you, Z. Hi, everyone. Uh, Marie Yap here, AWS Solutions Architect. So, um, 
.NET has been used by a lot of businesses impairing a lot of mission critical applications. We all start with monolith application and as what we discover as we add more features in this application, our code base becomes uh, larger and it has a sprawl and therefore it's longer to compile and it's much more difficult to deploy. Uh, the operational aspect of that one too with monolith applications and with all the dependencies as what Z has mentioned is that um, it's so difficult to scale. Other than that, um, one of the patterns that we see also is that developers use the same uh, release pipeline to deploy or push their code, making the release cycle much longer because there's a lot of congestion in that single release pipeline. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, like who could, uh, probably anyone here could relate that um, with monolithic applications, when you uh, just change a single line of code, it takes like a very high overhead process to redeploy that one back to production. So a lot of these are something that companies would like to change and wanted to embrace and move forward to microservices. So with microservices, uh, it drives agility in the application, which means that since microservices are independent with each other, you can scale them without any problems. Um, there's also an ease of uh, operation and iteration on the platform on top of that. Uh, there's faster pace of innovation because microservices drives a faster build, test, and release cycle. And also, at the end of the day, it's all about the happy customers, right? So it's whether it's an internal customers where the microservice team is uh, responsible for the microservice that they support. Uh, they operate independently um, because of this um, culture of being able to be accountable for the things that they own. So what are the tools and the common architecture patterns that we see here in AWS in deploying .NET Core microservices? So how do we start? So to start building your microservice uh, .NET Core uh, base uh, application, um, you install the AWS uh, toolkit for Visual Studio. So for Visual Studio 2017, you can actually uh, download that from the Visual Studio Gallery. And then if you are working with Visual Studio 2015, then you can download, download that one from the Visual Studio section from the AWS website. So within this toolkit, what you can do is um, you can create a profile that would contain your AWS credentials. And these credentials would allow you to basically create and uh, access resources uh, from AWS services that you can use within your .NET application. So the .NET SDK for um, uh, AWS SDK for .NET is actually um, supporting uh, the 3.5 framework, the 4.5 framework, and also the .NET Core, which allows you to deploy C# -sharp functions or .NET Core application in Lambda and API Gateway. And then um, we also do some integration or an extension for, for the Visual Studio team services and uh, team foundation servers. So um, it, uh, what we do is we have an extension called AWS Tools for uh, Visual Studio team services, which allows you to rapidly build and deploy your applications into AWS. Um, it is an extension where, for example, if you wanted to deploy your code into AWS using Elastic Beanstalk, there's a, a, a VSTS task for that one. And then uh, let's say if you plan to uh, deploy your uh, application and EC2 or EC2 container services, then uh, you can create a task for that also uh, using AWS Code Deploy, which is a managed uh, service for automated code deployment or application deployment in AWS. So if you do need to provision any other resources uh, using VSTS, you can create a task and reference a cloud formation template, which is infrastructure as code, and you can actually create any resources that you need for your .NET application. Um, Automation is a big thing in uh, creating microservices. It's one way for us to manage things seamlessly. So uh, therefore, there, we have tools also for command line and we also have tools for uh, PowerShell. So if you do need to um, know more of looking into an example and how to develop .NET Core and AWS, there's also another uh, session here in reInvent. It's called Dev330. So if you have some time, uh, please check that one out. So um, 
When you're looking into microservices, there are actually uh, three layers with that. So you have the UI or user interface layer, then you get your microservice, and then you got your data store. So um, at the very basic, anyone could actually deploy their microservice on EC2, and then put the EC2 in auto-scaling group, and then put that behind the load balancer. And then you could pick any data store that you want behind it, right? So, but then uh, this poses a lot of infrastructure management and administration. And so to avoid the heavy lifting of doing that one, uh, we're looking into the first approach here, which is a serverless type of architecture um, in uh, deploying your .NET Core microservice. So this is using the AWS Lambda architecture. So with this one in this three layer, you can see um, on the first layer, on the UI layer for all our, um, uh, our JS, our HTML, our static content, we can store it at an S3, which is fronted out by CloudFront. And then um, our microservice is basically using the API and uh, AWS, uh, API Gateway and AWS Lambda. And then for the data store, you have many options in here. You could go with Amazon DynamoDB for NoSQL, or if you need to have like more of like a transactional type of microservice, uh, then uh, there's a relational database for that. My uh, AWS uh, relational database service, and then you can also um, use like an in-memory uh, managed uh, database service called Amazon Elastic Cache. So, um, in in this case, what uh, what happens is that your .NET Core application is actually deployed as a Lambda function, and then the request is actually coming from the API gateway. So this request is being processed by Lambda, which is being passed to the .NET Core processing pipeline, and then. Um, what it does is that the request is being passed through to the data store if it needs to be accessed, uh, if it needs to access the data store. So with this one here, um, instead of using Kestrel, Nginx, or IIS, we're actually replacing that architecture using API Gateway and Lambda. And when you're looking into API Gateway and microservice type of architecture, it gives you a means of abstraction. It makes your microservice more agile, which means that you could have your APIs exposed in Amazon API Gateway, and then you could have anything behind the scene. You could, have, uh, you could deploy your application on Lambda, on EC2, or in a container, so it doesn't matter. Um, other than that, API Gateway is a managed service, so you don't have any servers to deploy. It scales out for you seamlessly, and also there is a feature in API Gateway that you can control the rate of request that goes into your microservice. Um, other than that, security, security is a very important part of microservice. So um, with API Gateway, it allows you to have a centralized place to put your security policies and control. It has a direct uh, integration with Lambda, so it uses like Lambda authorizers wherein um, it allows you to use the identity and access management policies in AWS and roles to um, restrict or grant permission to which uh, AWS Lambda function that contains your microservices can be accessed. So um, instead of putting all the security controls in your code, you can take that out and then put that on um, API Gateway to manage um, the security controls uh, for you and how your microservices would be accessed. Um, other than that, um, when we're working with microservices and especially like deploying new features or building, you know, like patch fixes and so on, it's important to do versioning. So you should be able, your applications or other applications should be able to have the time to adjust to the new, uh, you know, version of the API or, um, and also being able to roll back or access the old version of the APIs. So with that, uh, there is a versioning feature also on the API gateway, which is part of the API lifecycle management. Um, also, Lambda has versioning features. So both of these features allow you use to seamlessly access uh, both versions of your APIs. And then another approach that we see here is that um, if you're not ready for a serverless type of architecture, there is another option here. So um, EC2 container architecture is basically using the EC2 container services. So if, um, what is different here is actually in the middle. So instead of using API Gateway and uh, Lambda, we're using Amazon ECS, which is fronted by an application load balancer. So the application load balancer directs all 
all the requests to your microservices deployed on an Amazon EC2 uh, container instance, which contains your microservice um, API and business logic. So um, also announced this morning, there is a new uh, managed uh, container service, uh, Fargate. So um, instead of using ECS, uh, you can also use Fargate as, as another option in this architecture. So um, within ECS, there is a task parameter, which is a JSON file that you specify on what are the parameters that is needed for your .NET applications to run, and also, uh, on, and also the uh, Docker image, which is a .NET core Docker image that it would be uh, using for, uh, for the EC2 uh, container instances. So, um, so, uh, so with that, um, you know, uh, with all these managed services, um, it will be more easier for you to um, deploy your you know, .NET core-based microservice architecture. So um, to see this all come together, um, we'll be looking into an application that has 2.5, about 2.5 million visitors per month, about 85,000 logins per day, 70 microservices written across three different languages, about 3,500 uh, API requests per second. It's PCI compliant, and it took uh, about one year for this team to build from the ground up. So I would like to pass over to Danny from Experian to, Experian to share their journey to the microservices. Thanks, Marie. Hi, so I'm Danny Prashanik, and I've worked for Experian for 11 years doing uh, .NET programming and architecture. Um, been doing AWS for about two now, and like I said, I support Experian.co.uk. So this, uh, this architecture we're going to speak on is what runs our credit expert and credit matcher websites in the UK. So before I get into the AWS stuff, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we used to be, which is kind of what uh, Marie and Zlatan talked about all of the, the pitfalls of what happens before you get into AWS or the traditional architecture. So we were uh, an N-tier architecture platform running .NET 4.5, SQL Server, IIS web servers, WCF hosted web application servers. Uh, it says 50 developers. We actually had 100 plus developers across three different offices. So uh, we had single TFS instance for all of our code, which was very hard to deploy from. And our solution file was, we broke it up, but it was roughly 350 different CS projects. So it was a massive application that was split across the, the different web app and job servers. So uh, as you can imagine, it was not easy to maintain, it was not easy to update, and deployments took quite a long time. So all of our, wind all of our servers were actually Windows servers too with very complex configs. So tweaking any of that was, was definitely a pain. So, with that, we had a goal that we wanted to get into the cloud. Uh, another team on our, uh, in North America had just started dabbling in AWS, and so uh, we started looking at options as well, and we thought it would be best if we moved into AWS so we could leverage all the work that they had done. Um, another goal was to automate everything. As I said, in our old system, everything was very manual. From testing to deployments, everything was manual. So our goal was automate wherever we could. So unit tests, automation tests, automated deployments, et cetera. We, we, always, we, we definitely wanted to go with infrastructure as code because setting up new servers in our old world was very tedious. We had some of it scripted, but you know, spinning up a new, a new environment or new, new servers just took a lot of time. So everything that we wanted to do for all of our deployments and infrastructure, we had to have as code. It had to be in GitHub. It had to be uh, easily, easily maintained. And obviously, we wanted to go to microservices as well. Um, going from a monolith to microservices because it make it much easier for us to spread the deployment across our three different office locations and uh, against smaller teams. So uh, we also were going to transform from waterfall to agile. I'm sure a lot of you in the .NET world and maybe even the financial worlds have been more of a traditional waterfall, uh, waterfall SDLC. So we use this as an opportunity to actually transform the culture and the way our organization worked. So, um, it was, it was a difficult process in doing this, but we are successfully agile now, so. So, what are we gonna do? Well, fortunately, Microsoft came out with .NET Core. So, we started playing around with .NET Core uh, roughly in the beginning of 2015, or right when it came out in, or in the betas in 2015, I believe it was. So uh, we started prototyping in AWS summer of uh, 2015 when .NET Core was still uh, beta 7. Uh, this is actually our first Docker file when I deployed our first service to an EC2 instance. So very simplistic, but it, just to show how far we've come. 
Uh, Microsoft was maintaining their own Docker images uh, even back then, so it allowed us to rapidly get things into EC2 and try things. This was before we, uh, before ECS was even a thing. So, um, <clears throat> it, it's also open source. Uh, one of the one of the benefits of open source is it's allowed us to actually go through some of the Microsoft source code and figure out some of the issues that we're having. Uh, we've had developers contribute back to uh, Microsoft's repos and GitHub. One of those developers in the audience here somewhere. So uh, he submitted PRs and got them approved, so that's pretty cool. Um, obviously, it's cross-platform, so in our old world, we were primarily Windows servers. We wanted to move into a Linux-based environment. Uh, lessons learned from our North America team when they first started doing uh, their AWS deployments. They tried to take our old application and run it in Windows servers. And getting the Windows servers to auto-scale and spin up was very time-consuming. So uh, we, we made it a goal that we didn't want to have anything Windows-based at all anymore. We wanted to be 100% Linux. So Docker allowed us to do that. The other big thing was the AWS SDK support. Um, they were putting out updates every beta really quickly. And I actually worked closely with one of the AWS developers. It's the session that she's talking about, Dev330, um, and just making sure that we got the timely releases so that we could get that. Without having the AWS SDK support that we did, we wouldn't have been able to get this platform out the door in the time that we did. So one of the first things we did was we actually decided we we're going to sketch a uh, blueprint architecture um, for what we were trying to build. So this is a simplified version of it. but. Um, this was our, our goal and our idea of the different services we wanted to use in AWS. And like I said, we started this two years ago, so it was a little bit before API Gateway was a thing, so we're still using an Nginx reverse proxy. Um, but this was the starting point. Our goal was to use as many AWS services as possible. We didn't want to build things that Amazon could provide for us because we didn't want to be in the, uh, we wanted to focus on business logic and providing customers features as opposed to maintaining other services that we just didn't need to. So everywhere that there was an Amazon service, we, we utilized that. So from Dynamo, SNS, SQS, S3, Redshift, et cetera. Uh, in, this, in this diagram, one of the two things that you see that are that are not necessarily AWS services that we built ourselves um, are our service registry and our service configuration. So those are two key points that all of our microservices use. The service registry is basically that. It's a service lookup. So when, when services want to do a service-to-service -service call, they're going to call into this, um, this Redis cache, which is backed by a Dynamo database that has all of the uh, addresses for the different microservices. There's also the service config. As part of our deployment process, every microservice uh, fills out a service description or a JSON file that has all of its configuration data in it. I'll get to that a little bit more later, but that's the other key Redis config that we have that all microservices use, and those are the two shared components in this system. So I said that we broke, uh, we, we had to change our culture, so what do we do? So we actually broke up our dev team. So our dev team, like I said, was about 100 developers split across three offices. Everyone, there, people didn't necessarily have focus, it was just, we had, you know, had front-end developers, we had back-end developers, but no one had their own domain. So we decided to come up with the pizza team concept that Amazon had. We call them domain teams internally. But basically, we broke up uh, all the teams into different uh, focus, focus areas. So we have a customer profiling team, we have a credit report and score team, we have a CRM team, and uh, we have an alerts team, and we also have a compare team. So all these different teams allowed us to really give the teams focus, and those are the services they owned. It didn't have to worry so much about stepping on everybody else's toes. Another thing we did is we built a set of core libraries. Um, we, we, we wanted to have some standards, so we thought if we built a set of core libraries that we could actually uh, share amongst all microservices, it would allow us to speed things up, it allow us to have versions in those libraries, it allowed us to abstract some of the AWS services so everybody can do things in the same way. So it, it's a little bit of a wrapper around the AWS SDK, but it also allowed us to have some commonality with things. So all of our logging is maintained within the core library, um, some of our event publishing, which I'll get to in a little bit later, the message format, all of that is there the API standard requests coming in and out, all within the core library. And we have that all automated now in Travis CI. So when we push to our, our GitHub repo internally, um, a Docker build gets kicked off within Travis CI. And when it's done, they actually get pushed out to our own internal NuGet server. Uh, we're running Nexus OSS internally for that. So uh, we have uh, versions, I think we're up to 4.0 of our common libraries at this point now. And it's, it's been a real success story for us in terms of uh, really speeding things up. 
Another thing we did is we built a service generator. So uh, we used Yeoman. Yeoman was what Microsoft was putting out at the very beginning of .NET Core. And so the service generator allowed us to, really, like, to quickly scaffold new services. So we came up with a base template of what we thought a microservice should look like in terms of your, your Visual Studio project. And uh, you know, from, your, from your API layer all the way to your data layer, we took that and we basically came up with a template, put it in Yeoman, and now basically developers pull the Yeoman generator down, type in a few commands, and they have a microservice that pulls in all the base common libraries they need and will run right away. So it allow, it's allowed us to basically get new microservices out from having nothing to a full running service in under a day. So the, our development process obviously had to change a little bit too. We were, everyone's still on, for the most part, Windows machines. Our DevOps teams are not on Windows teams, or Windows machines, but all of our existing developers still had Windows machines. So it, getting Docker to work on Windows was a little bit of a challenge because we were running a little bit older Windows, it's not Windows 10, but we got it working and so, but the good thing about Docker is once you build your service locally, you can run it on Windows, you can deploy it in Docker, and then it's gonna go out into the EC2 Linux environment and really haven't had any issues there. Um, <laughs> all, all services are independent too and have their own independent GitHub repos, so there's no dependencies on service deployment. One team wants to deploy a service and they just go. They pull it from, pull it from GitHub and uh, go from there. On the right-hand side of this, you see what is called our metadata JSON. This is our own internal description layer that we've kind of built that our build pipeline reads. And uh, basically, this is going to go, when it's deploying the service to CloudFormation, it's going to read all the AWS resources that the, the dev team has requested. So if you need S3 buckets, if you need queues, Dynamo, et cetera, all of that's configured in here. And um, the deployment process is going to use that. We also, and this is what gets stored in that service configuration Redis cache that I, I mentioned. So when services start up, they're going to read all of this data. Obviously, all the, the resources are already created in AWS, but any other service specific configuration can be pulled out of this. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about the anatomy of what one of our microservices look like. So um, all of our microservices exist in ECS. Uh, so we are using container service, and each microservice consists of actually three containers. Um, what you can see is there's, we have what's called an SQS listener, an HTTP listener, and then the service container. So the two, the two listeners that you see in front of the microservice are both Node.js applications. Uh, they're the ones that are gonna be receiving um, SQS calls as well as all the HTTP calls. The HTTP listener, basically is validating the request before it gets to the microservice. So we wanted to pull all of that kind of out of the microservice so developers didn't have to worry about that. It's making sure headers are formed, that it knows what routes it can call, ACL and authorization and everything. So that's in the HTTP listener. The service container that you see in the back is where all the .NET business logic is. And obviously in this example, we're speaking on .NET, but we have multiple languages. We have a bunch in Java as well, even though we are primarily .NET. But this paradigm of you know, three containers is what we're using all throughout our entire ecosystem. And then we're using SNS and SQS for events. Um, all of our databases are DynamoDB, and we're storing objects in S3, and then we're our, our logs are all going into Kinesis through streams, and then they get output into Splunk for aggregation and troubleshooting. Um, yeah, that's that one. So then, <laughs> this slide's actually now obsolete, because I was gonna talk about scaling in ECS, but uh, I kind of think now with Fargate, we're gonna move into that. But in essence, we set up auto-scaling groups in ECS uh, to add more tasks. Um, as those tasks get added, uh, CloudWatch events occur, and, they ch and we have Lambda functions that are then listening to those CloudWatch events, whether they needed to add new EC2 instances within the uh, scaling groups. So as I said, <laughs> this is gonna probably change drastically uh, starting next week when I, when I go back to the office, but uh, we, ECS was a little bit clunky, but we've, we made it work with uh, all of the, the various Lambda functions and CloudWatch events, and it's, it's working great for us. Another thing that we're doing heavily all over our system is uh, PubSub with SNS and SQS. So, uh, we've, we really wanted to have a decoupled, event-driven, asynchronous architecture. And so we came up with this paradigm, which basically a ser uh, service can uh, generate any number of events that it wants, 
And as it generates that event, the events are then going to be consumed by multiple other services. So in this example, you can see uh, service D is, has three different queues that it's pulling from from three different events. Uh, but service E is only pulling one. But uh, the SNS topic for service C publishes the events to, to one SNS topic, which then gets routed out to multiple uh, SQS topics or SQS queues. Um, we use this all over our system. Two examples that we uh, we primarily use it for our for our CRM platform. So as as things happen in our system, um, an example is a customer gets created, um, a subscription gets updated or created, billing records, etc. We need to send all that to our CRM platform so that we can you know send out emails and you know whatnot to customers and communicate. So. Uh, we have a service that basically is sitting there listening to roughly 11 different events for things that are happening in the system, and then it pushes it off to the CRM platform. We also use it for our Salesforce integration. So again, as, as things happen uh, around our system, customers get created, we use that so we can push data off to Salesforce. A little bit more detail on that. So the way that it works is basically each service that wants to publish an event it describes, it's, it's very simple, it, push, it puts a block of data in the metadata JSON called uh, SNS Topics Published. And literally, it's just a, a named event, a logical ID. Our deployment process is actually going to then kick in, and um, when, it, when, it, when it actually creates the queue, it's going to put the physical ID in there. And our common library knows to read that logical ID, but then pull the physical ID so that it, actu that it actually can write to the SNS topic. Um, on the other side, the subscribers, Basically, it, this puts all the information of what event it needs to listen to, what queue it has, and then the, the, the neat thing here is the, the route. So basically, each event, each, uh, each queue that it reads off of is configured to route to a specific event with inside the uh, system. So as it reads that message off, um, it will then pull out the message body and basically does an HTTP, HTTP post to the service container. So this allows... It, we standardize the message format within our common libraries so that any language can publish the event. The SQS listener can then receive that event and then uh, push the body off to the via standard RESTful call in the service container. This also allows us to set visibility timeout um, and whatever other uh, configuration values that you would have for a specific SQS queue. So, uh, the visibility timeout's been really helpful, too, in, in terms of allowing us to make it so messages can be read quicker or slower if, if we have an external uh, third party that may be taking longer to respond. So set the visibility timeout uh, longer so that we're not pulling messages off the queue and retrying them too quickly. Another thing that we did is uh, we've, we're using uh, Hadoop for some, for some big data batch processing. And we're doing this all using .NET Core, Docker Compose. Um, basically, we built a Docker Compose image that has a master and the multiple workers. Right now, we're doing it with four workers, but we can scale out with more. Um, in essence, what this is is it's a standard, uh, standard Hadoop install that reads uh, the mapper and reducer DLLs that we write ourselves, and it orchestrates calling that. So uh, we have quite a bit of data processing that we do all the time, and like I said, we have a lot of .NET developers. So we wanted to see, ideally we would have loved to use EMR so we wouldn't roll this ourselves, but since EMR doesn't support .NET, we came up with this solution. And it's, it's pretty quick, actually. Uh, in the next example, I will show you. So in this, this example, we took it a step further. So normally in Hadoop, you have uh, mapper and reducer. So in, in our example, we took it one step further and we came up with the idea of having a preprocessor and a postprocessor. So our preprocessor in this example is calling Aurora and pulling roughly uh, a million records out of Aurora, doing some massaging on the data, putting, that, putting it into a CSV file, and then passing it on to the mapper. And then the mapper, in, the mapper does more data manipulation on it, which then gets reduced. But, and then at the end, we have a postprocessor, which basically reads the output file and uploads it to uh, SFTP somewhere. But the cool thing with this is that it's all standard .NET. Um, some, the, the, the difficult part was kind of the orchestration and getting the pre and post processor. But we wrote a Python script. All of these are Docker containers. All of them are standard .NET Core DLLs. And like I said, it's very performant. We, we can process a million records out of this database in roughly eight minutes. So you guys are probably wondering, why does all this matter? This is all kind of standard .NET architecture stuff and standard AWS architecture. And I think 
basically because Microsoft has open source .NET Core and allowed it to run on Linux, it's really made uh, .NET Core a first class citizen AWS. So all of these things that we've done, we were able to easily take from our North America side, which was doing stuff in Java and do everything in .NET Core ourselves. So we're able to repurpose our existing development team without having to hire new people and figure, all, uh, figure out new ways of doing things. And so in just a year, we went from an on-prem solution to a fully cloud-based uh, microservices system in .NET. So, um, with that, I think that's it, and we'll open the floor to questions. I think the mics are up here. Yeah, so, so this microphone's up front. Anybody who has any questions for uh, either one of us, for Danny or for myself or Marie, please come up. Otherwise, uh, for the rest of you, thank you so much for coming. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> question about uh, support for .NET Core 2.0 on Lambda, if you have any sort of uh, estimate or... <laughs> there hasn't been any announcements, yeah. so I'm just fishing. It hasn't been announced yet, but yeah. it's uh, coming up. Soon, yeah. okay. Yes. Yeah. All right, maybe tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Pretty much. So you mentioned you use Redis for your configuration. Uh -huh. uh, I guess you have multiple environments, like integration, testing, Correct, prod. Yeah. How do you handle you know, provisioning that configuration on each environment? Uh, we have different Jenkins jobs basically for each environment. So our deployment process has, an in we basically have just instances of Jenkins and our deployment servers per environment. Got it, but where do you store the secrets? Let's say the connection oh. string, things like that. Uh, it, it does get, it's, it's something that we have to do a little bit by hand. Uh, right. it's, our deployment process, we have a, a separate configuration table that we write to once and the deployment process reads it and we clear that out as it deploys the, the secrets and things like that. Got so it. you could be using also parameter store on our side to actually store secrets that's integrated with KMS, it's encrypted. It's actually very good. It is a primer on how we store secrets in these particular cases. Okay. Now in that scenario, let's say you have multiple accounts. At least that's how we do it, right? Like dev account, QA account, prod account in AWS. That means you have to keep them in sync. You see like Configure yeah. dev, configure QA, configure pro, yeah, you, repeat you, it. You, you do. And, and as you know, in AWS, we automate everything. Correct. And that, ingl that includes even configuration uh, aspect of uh, system manager, uh, including obviously, uh, you know, parameter store and all of that. So uh, we will, there will be also updates in, in which way that's going to be even more simplified. Uh, but I'm going to leave that to, for others uh, <laughs> to okay. announce. But right now, the way we are doing it and the way I've been doing it specifically is literally by, uh, in, by means of uh, uh, doing uh, changes you know, to, to, to infrastructure configuration uh, on multiple accounts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, just, ju not just for parameter store, but generally. Got it. You know. OK, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm just curious your thoughts on uh, Windows containers uh, in, in Windows 2016 and, I actually, and how yeah, they we, work with Amazon and ECS I'll and let them talk, Fargate and all that stuff. We didn't mess with Windows containers at all. We just went straight for the Linux because yeah. we just that's what we were, we decided we were going to go with. So I've been building things on. in Windows containers as a PLCs, and, okay. I'm, here, and I'm yeah. kind of been hitting brick walls because ECS isn't fully supported. Why, why do you want to use Windows containers versus? With on a core versus just going with the uh, Linux containers. We're dealing with legacy apps that we're converting that aren't .NET Core. You know, okay. Yeah, that's you know, fair. Mainly. <laughs> so I don't know if you've seen, but you know, we've made some progress around ECS support for the Windows containers. Uh, you can actually, you know, you can run Windows containers. Well, I mean, you it says. Uh, Production not production ready, like the third line on your yeah, CS page. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you've been very careful about it. So, so yeah, surely, but it, it, that, that shouldn't preclude you from starting up, you, you, uh, or rather testing it out right now, because it's it's really a matter of time. Take it from me before it's it, it is. Uh, so, uh, so that that'll actually give you a good chance to actually start working with them. Um, you can also use any other. Uh, you know, uh, container orchestration. Right, I was curious uh, if the managed Kubernetes supported the window, because Kubernetes I've been does. using, yeah, COPS, yeah. Kubernetes, yeah. right, to, 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 to do that. So, so there are ways, and now you have actually Kubernetes support. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are so many options to which you can do. Okay. Um, we, we already have like, you know, images or oh, yeah. for running, like uh, uh, for, for hosting, uh, you know, containers and all this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, we've had it for a while with Windows 2016, Amis. 
and all that. So yeah, I encourage you. Yeah, we can talk offline as well. Sure, sure. Thanks a lot. A Appreciate it. Yeah, no issues. Hey, those um, I think you call them service definition, but those JSON configs. Mm -hmm. uh, what was what was processing those, or what at what point were they being picked up? And it, so we have an entire uh, basically our DevOps application that uh, it's written in Python and it uses uh, the, the standard AWS libraries to then deploy. So uh, we, we create Jenkins jobs that basically execute those Python scripts, read the service definitions, and then create cloud formation, cloud formation templates. All right, thanks. Troposphere? No, oh, not Troposphere. Yeah. It's just model. <laughs> it's just model. So uh, what kind of, or how do you handle it when tables change for different versions of services? If you had to roll them back, go forward. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's a that's something we're we're working on right now. So um, right now, as we've deployed new version, we deployed new versions of services in our infrastructure. We've actually kept the same data stack. Uh, we we haven't changed any of the schemas yet, or we've created an entirely new version of the service and then migrate the data to that to to make it work. So we're doing a couple different things. We're running services either side by side, they would have the same data stack, or we're just going completely new and then pushing the data over to a new Dynamo table. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, hi. Uh, how do you handle relational uh, data for in case among all those microservices? Uh, we're not using any relational databases. Everything is using Dynamo. So uh, basically, we've just decided that what, whatever, whatever objects are important to that microservice, we're trying to keep our microservices very, microservices very lean. So uh, yeah. like I said, a customer profile has one set of data. We have another service that might just have your profile preferences for certain things. So we're not doing any relational database at all right now. You, okay. you could be using our RDS service, uh, which actually includes SQL Server as well. Or if you want to go cheaper on a licensing, uh, and and you want a just as good, if not better, enterprise-ready database, Aurora is a good choice. Yeah, the problem that we are trying to solve, like we have a product stable that we sure. probably will need everywhere. In uh, like we we can create uh, 30, 40, 50 microservices. So how can we see all so those you, products? Everywhere? So the way that we've kind of done stuff like that is basically whatever the microservice that has that data store behind it, define your APIs and have other microservices call that. So whatever, define your data store, define your your, your APIs and what your data your outputs want to be, and then you have those other microservices call it to get it because we have a products API or product service as well, and it's used all over our system to get the data from. But how do I know uh, the product? I will just have a GUID or some uh, something like that uh, somewhere in other microservices. I see what you mean. Um, yeah, you have to maintain that somewhere. You're right. So uh, I guess it. it, it I'd have to know a little bit more about the domain to tell you, but yeah. I mean, it is it is some of the. I mean, uh, you you can either pass it kind of um, as uh, you know through task definitions um, in ECS. I don't know if you guys are you currently using ECS uh, uh, no, when you yet. execute it. We are looking into it. Okay, so so there's ways you know you can just pass it or just pass it through command, right? Uh, that's a Docker command. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know through task definition files. Um, and uh, y you can actually you know, define also constraints and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, but you can actually pass that, the environment variables and all that sort of stuff, you can, you can pass it through or just uh, do a fetch and run, uh, which, we, which, we, which is basically a, um, once again, a Docker command that goes and fetches and runs when it starts running um, um, a, um, a script that might may be sitting on an S3 or something like that. And then you can continuously change the script or whatever the case is with references that you need, and this will always fetch and run when it, when it executes. And I, I know what you mean. We've, we've kind of done some of that. So like we take our product service, and then we have another service that may need to reference those. Once mm -hmm. the product service is defined and some of those values are already there, we'll mm -hmm. provide those to the other service that may need to use them, and they can kind of deal with it in their own configuration way. But I know that can be, depending on how many products you have, that can get pretty unruly. So we're just trying to make sure the APIs are well defined in the data stores up front before we even uh, write any code on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So, using your custom CI CD pipeline, for somebody who who's using TFS, what would, would be the recommendation? I know the toolkit for TFS and VSTS was just re released recently. Is it easy to use? How mature is it? Is that what we should be looking at? Yeah, so, so I've, I've been doing quite a bit of these uh, you know, implementations recently. It's really all about configuring it to push it out to S3. Mm -hmm. And then you know, getting code pipeline to, 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 to have S3 registered as a source in this case. So as soon as the package gets pushed out to S3, um, uh, code pipeline automatically picks it up, starts building it, 
deploying it, whatever you define in it, right? Yeah, okay. the key thing there is uh, because uh, you can create a task in um, uh, BSTS, the, uh, the toolkit integration. So you can uh, invoke the cloud formation and basically cloud formation will, let's say, create a code pipeline and then within the code pipeline, you can specify whether you want to uh, call code build or code deploy or others and then you can put your build artifact on S3 so that it's accessible anywhere. Yeah, okay. but you don't, you don't need to create those things on the fly. I'm, I'm guessing you would have code pipeline already defined with all the steps, and then you would yes. have continuous packages that are just being sent Basically over. Basically, we just need the final step. Just push them onto S3. Yes. That's yeah. what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's literally, literally a pattern that we do for all the non-.NET uh, <laughs> services as well and, and all that sort of stuff. S3 is really a go-to thing. OK, um, thanks. I'm just wondering, how did you deal with your WCF services themselves? We didn't, so we rewrote everything. Yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, because uh, we, we had quite a bit of, everything was WCF in the back end before, and so we basically just rewrote everything. Yeah, that's so, what I was Sorry. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I mean, because Microsoft doesn't even support it anymore, so. Um, API gateway, man. <laughs> <laughs> My question is around, like, you know, how would you handle failures, uh, especially with uh, non-idempotent requests? Because I don't want to create, you know, keep on creating, uh, you know, uh, objects, right? When I make posts, uh, so how would you handle those situations? I mean, in case of failures, we've tried to make everything as um, idempotent as possible. Uh -huh. uh, I know that's not always the case, though, but that. Um, so we, we've had to deal with some of that in, in terms of the SQS processing, you know, of requests coming in. And so the, sometimes we've actually maintained if we've pushed off one of those requests already in Dynamo. Um, so it's not, it's not really stateful, but at least we know, yes, this request has already been received. We don't need to necessarily send this off to our third party again so in case a message comes in twice. Or if, it, if the message fails, though, we're just using standard, um, the SQS listener has, just listens for standard HTTP codes. If it doesn't get a 200 back, it's going to go back on the queue and be reprocessed. So let's just say you made a request and it was successful, mm -hmm. but while getting the response, it failed. And uh, since it, uh, you, you failed to receive the response, you might try it again which is gonna create another... It like, will, and that's, and that's why we've had to make our services able to accept messages twice and deal with that if that happens. So, so. you use like, you know, unique IDs for requests, or how do you yes. handle those? Yes, we're using, it's one, it's the mess, I believe it's the message ID within the uh, SNS SQS message. Okay, and one quick question, like, did you guys use uh, web APIs for... Yeah, all of, all of, basically we decided that everything was gonna be RESTful, I should have said that, but, all of our services are RESTful, and it, so it's using Kestrel and Web API as the front end. So we just wanted to make everything um, consistent, so that way our Java services are using you know, RESTful APIs, our .NET services are RESTful APIs as well. And the packages that you said, uh, they were NuGet packages, right? Mm -hmm. And how were you consuming them in Java so, world? So, sorry, the NuGet packages are strictly for the .NET services. Okay. Our, our, Java, our Java team has built their own set of common libraries as well. But basically, we kind of, we mapped out what we thought were like common core functions between both languages, and we built libraries up for all of that. Like I said, so the logging, the SNS message format, stuff like that. It's all consistent across the board. It's just each, each language has its own set of libraries to maintain. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Hi guys, uh, thank you for hosting the session. Uh, <laughs> uh, quick question around uh, authentication. How are you guys uh, authenticating your microservices? Uh, I can't talk about that. You can't? I can't, no, oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me go into my next I, What question. I can tell you though is that we're, we're heavily using IAM everywhere. Oh, okay. So I, like each microservice and the, the resources that it, can, that it has are all using IAM roles. So okay. uh, micro, basically okay. microservices only have purview and access to its own resources. Okay. That's yeah. all I can know. So we would advise basically using roles. You can have a, applied roles to literally each of the containers that is running. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and then you would, you know, whatever code is running on top of it would uh, um, effectively assume that role. And then you can define specific and explicit policies for what it can access, how, and all that sort of stuff. That way, you're not using any secrets. You're not using mm -hmm. any. You know, saying so you don't have to worry about any of these things. Um, you know, and um, you know, it's it's it's, it's really secure. Okay, and um, a follow-up question on performance monitoring. How are you guys uh, doing that? Are you using New Relic or? Uh, we're using Blaze Meter to do all our performance testing. Uh, okay. So we test everything before we even go to prod, and we do load testing on that. Okay. Uh, and uh, how we are you, we're waiting for App Dynamics for .NET though. Okay, so. yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. 
so my question is like how to deal with the third library like the DR files currently to upgrade to the microservice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've we've they're all versioned, right? So every, all the versions are maintained within GitHub, and we're doing you know we're doing major minor patch, and so it's the responsibility we, it's responsibility for each microservice team to decide when they're going to pull in a new version of the library. Um, but we're we work as a team, and you know we let everybody know that when we are pushing out the the new versions, what they are. We have release notes and whatnot. We try not to mandate anything unless there's maybe security things that we're putting in there, and then we say, okay, in the next sprint, everybody needs to pull in maybe a new major version because of X or whatever. But um, it's it's the responsibility of each team to pull in that version. Yeah. So uh, what about the library that doesn't support like the .NET Core, that just like currently just support in the Windows? We literally went everything that was only .NET Core. We have nothing that we have no Windows oh. dependencies at all. Okay. Every, everything is 100%.NET Core when it comes to .NET right now. We did we didn't take it. Whatever was legacy left was there. We may have brought code in that might have been business logic, but we wrote everything from scratch .NET Core 100% from the ground up. So okay. so, uh, so yeah, go ahead. Sorry, you wanted you wanted to. Yeah. Follow? So the second question is about the so currently we are using the VB.NET. We're trying to transfer, but the .NET Core 2.2.0 is just supporting that, but currently it's not right. So is there any plan or? Yeah, yeah, there, there, there will be announcement. So I would say look out. Okay, uh, there is cool. a plan to it. So maybe the, go to maybe the Dev 330 session because those are the .NET SDK developers and they might be, or the yeah, yeah, they, .NET they, AWS they, SDK developers, they could, might be able to help you a little bit more with that. Well, yeah, they, they, they'll probably be allowed to tell you. Okay, <laughs> cool. So I think we're but, out of time. So, yeah, if, so, if, we wanna, so if people still have questions, we can talk we, to you guys outside. We can take we, it outside. So, okay, sorry, okay, guys. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, we're out of time. We've got to vacate. Uh, we'll take the questions just outside. So please catch us there.